This is a video created by the minimally invasive gynecology group at the Ottawa Hospital, highlighting a novel management approach to treating Asherman syndrome. The objectives of this video are to describe a stepwise approach to treatment of Asherman syndrome in an outpatient hysteroscopy setting, to present three cases of hysteroscopic atesiolysis, and to highlight our experience with this management strategy. Asherman syndrome is characterized by the presence of intrauterine synechia, as well as symptoms such as amenorrhea, pelvic pain, or infertility. Hysteroscopic lysis of adhesions is regarded as the mainstay of treatment and results in high rate of resumption of normal menses. Adhesiolysis does carry a risk of uterine perforation, and repeat procedures may be required to achieve sustainable results. Outpatient hysteroscopy is an effective method to evaluate the uterine cavity and treat pathology. Procedures such as polypectomies and transcervical sterilization can be performed without regional or general anesthetic in an ambulatory setting. Hysteroscopic lysis of adhesions in such a setting may offer patients several advantages, including reduced anesthetic risk and improved postoperative pain control. We employ the following approach when performing outpatient hysteroscopic lysis of adhesions. Vaginoscopy is used to attain access to the uterine cavity. Patients are offered several anesthetic options, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or IV sedation. Depending on their location, of the adhesions, it may be reasonable to start with blunt dissection with gentle pushing with the hysteroscope and pressure of the flowing saline to break apart the adhesions. Sharp dissection with scissors is used to break apart denser adhesions. You must stop and reevaluate your location within the uterine cavity when the patient experiences sudden increase in pain or if you encounter excess bleeding. We'll now present several cases of outpatient hysteroscopic adhesiolysis. The first patient is a 33-year-old female, G2A2, with a history of two dilatation and curtage procedures performed following first trimester losses. She presents with oligomenorrhea and difficulty conceiving. Diagnostic hysteroscopy reveals an adhesion in the mid-uterus. Micro-scissors are introduced through a 5.8 millimeter operative hysteroscope. These are used to release the adhesions. Further assessment reveals some filmy adhesions near the right cornea, which are also released. At the completion of this case, a normal uterine cavity is seen. The patient conceives three months following treatment and has gone on to have an uneventful term vaginal delivery. Although this is a low complexity case, this example highlights the fact that a patient can avoid general or regional anesthetic for treatment of uterine adhesions. This procedure only took seven minutes to perform and the patient was able to go home shortly after. Our second patient also presents with a similar history of postpartum curtage and subsequent amenorrhea. Diagnostic hysteroscopy reveals thicker adhesions in this case in the mid-uterus, resembling a uterine septum. The micro-scissors are used to release these dense adhesions. Pushing and spreading can also be performed using the scissors, as long as one is very cognizant of their location in the uterine cavity. Note that the adhesions are largely avascular and bleeding is not seen. The gentle flow of the saline allows the cavity to open up as the adhesions are released. Evascularity of the adhesions is a key clue to safety. As the dissection approaches the myometrium layer, we would see increased bleeding. Also, the adhesions are not innervated, and therefore patients will tolerate sharp adhesiolysis as well. However, the myometrium is innervated, and once entered, patients will suddenly experience a sharp increase in pain. These two features are important in mitigating risk of uterine perforation, and it is imperative to frequently recheck your position in the uterus and reevaluate your progress. At the completion of this case, we will see that once the mid uterine adhesions are released, the fundal portion of the endometrium cavity appears normal. For further reassurance, the patient is brought back for a repeat diagnostic hysteroscopy, which is not seen here, and we see maintenance of the normal shape of the uterine cavity. Our final patient is a 35-year-old female, Gravita 1 Para 1, who had a spontaneous vaginal delivery complicated by a postpartum hemorrhage requiring an immediate dilatation and curatage. She again presents with amenorrhea, noted after cessation of breastfeeding. Hysteroscopy revealed significant adhesions in this case, obstructing the right cornea. Orientation is very difficult in this case, and so again we stress that you should frequently recheck your location within the uterus. Gentle cutting with the micro scissors is systematically performed under direct vision. The hysteroscope is also used to spread apart filmy adhesions when possible. 
The fact that the use of electrosurgery is avoided, we believe may minimize the tissue inflammatory response and thereby decrease the risk of return to TG. Postoperative treatment with estrogen is also employed for this purpose. We would like to highlight that in this difficult case, the patient received only preoperative non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and tolerated the procedure well. For certain patients, intravenous sedation may be used. Verbal reassurance provided by the surgeon and the nursing team is also imperative in decreasing pain, increasing patient comfort and satisfaction. In our case, when we see our view obstructed by the tissue cut away from the adhesion, the grasp burns introduced and these adhesions are removed. At the conclusion of this case, we do see that much of the uterine cavity has been restored but the patient will be brought back for the repeat diagnostic gastroscopy with possible repeat adhesiolysis in two to three weeks. In cases of advanced adhesions, repeat procedures may be necessary, and performing repeat hysteroscopic lysis of adhesions on an outpatient basis may compound the risk reduction this treatment alternative offers patients. Lastly, we would like to share with you our results of the outpatient hysteroscopic adhesiolysis at the Ottawa Hospital. We performed a retrospective case series looking at 20 Asherman patients. Baseline characteristics of patients can be seen here. 15% had mild adhesions, 50 moderate, and 35% severe according to March classification. In 35% of patients, previous hysteroscopic adhesiolysis had been attempted. This figure depicts the distribution of number of hysteroscopic treatments required, with most of our patients having one or two procedures. Outcomes were available for 19 patients. All of the patients experienced normal menses following treatment. Seven patients achieved a spontaneous pregnancy and six have gone on to deliver to date. Two patients required hysteroscopic adhesiolysis performed in the main operating room, mainly to treat a submucosal fibroid concurrently. The most common form of analgesia used in 89% of our cases was non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. In conclusion, Asherman syndrome can often present difficulty in achieving successful treatment. We present a retrospective case series demonstrating that hysteroscopic adhesiolysis for the treatment of Asherman syndrome is a feasible option in an outpatient setting. We suggest that outpatient hysteroscopic adhesiolysis is a viable alternative to traditional treatment of Asherman syndrome in the operating room, likely with a more favorable side effect profile. Larger case series of treatment of Asherman syndrome in an outpatient setting should be undertaken to provide a more accurate assessment of outcome measures. We thank you for your attention and welcome any questions.